Hello, everyone. Uh, we are continuing um, uh, with the uh, uh, discussion of uh, uh, Augustine uh, ideology and propaganda. And uh, um, uh, we are looking here at the last slide from the previous section uh, with the mausoleum of Augustus, um, the sundial, and the altar of peace. And so I think it would be helpful to uh, uh, think about um, this whole process by thinking about the main gods that Augustus claimed uh, supported him. And so obviously uh, Mars altar, um, but in addition to Mars altar or Venus, Apollo also played a significant role. And now if you are not um, uh, familiar with sort of uh, Greek or Roman uh, mythology, it's helpful to think of Apollo as uh, both a potentially uh, quite capable god in terms of fighting, but also um, a god responsible for uh, literature uh, and uh, poetics. And uh, I think these varied um, aspects of Apollo all helped uh, Augustus uh, be interested in him. And very importantly, uh, he uh, rebuilt uh, uh, a temple uh, of, uh, the, of Apollo in Rome, uh, which is uh, known as the Temple of Palatine Apollo. And that was in coordination with uh, building a new house for himself also on the Palatine Hill. And the Palatine um, um, gives our word palace its origin. And therefore, this is a, an interesting uh, uh, point. So he built himself a home, a palace, if you wish, on the Palatine. And next to it, he builds uh, uh, the temple of uh, Palatine uh, Apollo. And we have some of the reliefs uh, from uh, this uh, 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 temple surviving today. Uh, for example, uh, this one is really interesting because it can uh, help us see how exactly uh, the uh, uh, message uh, about the gods is connected to Augustus's own uh, narrative about his own success. And so what we see here on this uh, uh, particular relief is that on the left, we have uh, Apollo. Apollo usually carries a bow uh, and arrows, and uh, uh, here he is on, on the left. Uh, both of them are obviously in the heroic nude. And on the right, uh, we see Hercules, um, who is uh, um, uh, a, a figure in Greek mythology who uh, ended up becoming a god but was not one of the original uh, divinities. And what you see here in the middle is uh, 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 something from uh, the Oracle of Delphi, um, a, uh, a tripod that's very typical of that place. And what you see essentially is um, uh, this Apollo figure and the Hercules figure are sort of both trying to uh, uh, claim it. Now, people uh, uh, suggest that potentially the, the facial features on this depiction imply that this Apollo is Augustus and this Hercules is Mark Antony. And so the idea uh, with such reliefs would be is to sort of imply that, you know, first of all, of course, that um, Augustus corresponds to a god versus Mark Antony corresponds to a, a, a sort of lesser god, uh, but also it would imply that you know the story of his success has a sort of divine parallel in it. Uh, similarly, we see in another uh, uh, building that we mentioned already is in the field of Mars, is um, uh, the altar of peace. And so this kind of actually brings to a completion of our discussion how Augustus is a man of war and man of peace, because the altar of peace was sort of a new idea in Rome, like traditionally peace was not receiving uh, an altar. So this is a really large uh, uh, scale uh, uh, altar that survives um, uh, almost completely today and is reconstructed in Rome and you should one future day uh, definitely go and uh, uh, visit and this is sort of uh, another way of imagining it and what's uh, interesting about the um, the altar is that if we look at it uh, from above uh, we see that um, Essentially, the altar depicts a religious ceremony by showing processions on the side, but then also puts, again, just like on the forum, key figures of uh, uh, Augustan propaganda onto its reliefs, right? So, for example, 
uh, here we see uh, the, the goddess Roma and Mother Earth on uh, one side, and Romulus and Remus and Aeneas um, on the other. So just to give you an idea of what this imagery would look like, here we get um, uh, sort of Mother uh, Earth. There's some discussion exactly what's going on. But what you should notice about it is that it's a, it's a figure of abundance. It's a figure of the peace that has come. And so now there is lots of... Uh, 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 you know, animals, and there is lots of uh, uh, produce that's happening, and there are babies, so there's fertility on land, but also among humans, and this is sort of the gift of peace, right, that's being implied here. So looking back again, uh, it's also important to point out that in the processional friezes on the side, uh, which look something like this, if you stand uh, uh, next to them, key figures of uh, Augustus and his allies and family are depicted with facial features. You recall Augustus is a priest, so of course he should be in the procession, right? So on this side, we, on the south side, we actually see Augustus in procession as a priest, uh, right? He is, his uh, head is a little bit cut off, but you can make him out, along with Agrippa. And uh, so essentially this also gives us a sense of, uh, you know, how the family is tying into uh, this message as priests, as responsible for peace. And uh, importantly, among the many other figures, there is even some uh, children depicted. So this is something that we will uh, slowly uh, start to uh, uh, pay attention to, which is Augustus, of course, doesn't just want to rule himself, but he also wants to establish a dynasty. So he is followed uh, uh, by successors uh, from his family. So to recap, uh, what we have seen so far is an intense amount of religious and semi-religious building activity and an intense desire to be all-encompassing in all the messages. All of history now leads to Augustus. All of uh, uh, religion is essentially centered in his head. And this whole um, sequence is beautifully represented in uh, the secular games of 17 BCE. Now, when you look at that word, uh, secular, uh, most people think of secular as something that is not religious, but notice the spelling, either I misspelled it, which I didn't, uh, but that it's A-E, saecular, which actually comes from a Latin word, saeculum, which means a hundred years or the maximum extent of a human's lifetime. And in 17 BCE, Augustus proposed that it was time to celebrate the end of a cycle, the end of such a cycle in, in uh, Rome, which hasn't been celebrated for a long time. And the idea is here again that peace has come and this is a time of renewal. And so this is uh, uh, a poem uh, by uh, one of um, uh, uh, the Augustan uh, great poets, Horace, and this is a little excerpt from it that just gives us a bit of a tone of how these uh, poems sound. So, accept our prayer this sacred year, when as the Sibyl's voice ordained for ages yet to come, pure maids and youth unstained invoke the gods who love the sevenfold hills of Rome. So you can really have the sense of how religion, patriotism are connected in here and how uh, uh, this sort of becomes like an all encompassing uh, 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 message. Now, I think that um, what is helpful to uh, uh, think about uh, for us as we are uh, moving towards uh, uh, the uh, um, discussion of uh, poetry in this period, and that was the first bit that we have seen, is that Augustus was very conscious about using uh, poetic messages to support uh, uh, his own uh, claim to power. So in this case, uh, for example, uh, or is this secular hymn functioned uh, that way, supporting Augustus's claim that, you know, the end of a hard period has come and now it was time to um, have peace and renewal. And uh, maybe even more importantly, the, the poet, poet and poem that we are going to uh, read uh, today and then also on uh, uh, in the next class, Virgil's Aeneid also sort of deals with this issue of sort of how uh, this all makes sense, how the uh, um, Rome was meant to have Augustus as a ruler and how in fact this is what was always meant to be. And notice that that is a key part of the message, right? That this, this is what was supposed to happen, uh, which is partially a religious message, but also um, sort of questions uh, 
or does not really allow anybody else to question uh, that Augustus is in power. Importantly, I want to point out uh, to you this figure. This is just the HBO picture. Uh, HBO Rome uh, has a, a figure represented uh, uh, who is uh, Messinas, who was essentially uh, um, a minister of uh, poetic output, uh, if you wish, an unofficial one in this period, who actually supported poets who worked on projects that were related to um, related to Augustus and his uh, uh, greatness. And among the poets that he supported was also the poet about whom uh, we are starting to talk about today, and that is Virgil. Sometimes you see Virgil's name uh, uh, spelled with a V-I-R-G-I-L. I'm okay with that. This is a little closer to the Latin, so I'm just going to stick with that, but you are free to uh, spell it either way. So Virgil is a poet who uh, lived between 70 BCE and, and um, uh, uh, 19 uh, BCE, and uh, he is uh, coming from this part of uh, uh, what today would be northern uh, uh, Italy, but at that time was called Cisalpine Gaul, Gaul on this side of the the southern side of the Alps, and um, he was educated in Rome and Naples, and uh, he uh, was one of these poets who was associated with Messinas, who introduced him to uh, um, Augustus, and he became something of a court writer. Now, I want to be very cautious here with implying that um, Virgil would fully endorse the Augustan uh, message, which a proper court writer would always do. But at the same time, I think it's very clear that he's engaging uh, with the Augustan uh, message in his works. And so these works uh, uh, included uh, Virgil's works, um, uh, the eclogues, uh, which were sort of these pastoral poems uh, describing uh, uh, various things about Virgil and his friends, and, and they are pretending to be um, sort of shepherds, a simple life. Uh, and uh, uh, one of these is actually an incredibly uh, uh, famous poem that uh, claims that one day a baby will be born who will change the world. Uh, written around uh, the time of Augustus, uh, later Christians appropriated that poem to argue that this uh, predicted uh, the birth of uh, uh, Jesus, um, which is an interesting uh, little aside. Uh, he also wrote some more books, uh, uh, the Georgics, uh, that uh, uh, concern farm life. And I think before you are starting to get overwhelmed by shepherds and, and uh, farm life, what I would say about that, that it's both connected to a longing towards peace and towards um, uh, the end of warfare. Of course, Rome had civil wars for quite some time before uh, um, Augustus uh, took over uh, individual uh, power. Um, but in addition, I think it also has to do with that uh, abundance, this age of like, oh, farms, you know, and produce, and there is, uh, you know, everything is going so well that that's part of uh, uh, the message. The most important uh, poem that uh, Virgil ever wrote, though, nevertheless, without any doubt, is the Aeneid, which is an epic poem in uh, uh, 12 books uh, that we know uh, was uh, incomplete at the time of Virgil's death in 19 BCE. Uh, we also hear that this was uh, uh, written at the request of uh, uh, Augustus. And in it, um, Virgil undertook uh, to make an epic poem uh, uh, connect uh, Rome's double foundation myth. So you recall there is a Trojan origin to Rome. This was a long time ago uh, in January that we talked about it. So here we are in what would be more than the Turkey in Troy, uh, which is where Aeneas comes from, who uh, arrives through a very uh, tumultuous sea journey, uh, finally to the area of Italy where Rome eventually will be founded. And then uh, you recall Rome will be founded quite a few generations later uh, by Romulus, according to this depiction. And so this is the story, uh, in particular the story of Aeneas, that Virgil will undertake uh, 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 to, to narrate. And I think that it's um, it should be absolutely clear to us that this is a, a story very, very uh, um, favorable and important for uh, Augustus, who depicted Aeneas, or who had uh, Aeneas depicted sacrificing on the um, altar of peace, and was very interested in uh, uh, promoting Aeneas as sort of a, a, an earlier version of, uh, of uh, 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 Romulus. 
And so uh, this is uh, the poem, uh, uh, the Enaid, uh, that we are going to continue our class discussion with in lecture three.